It's time to pet proof your home on this episode of the Paul Report. We're talking with Dr. Tina Wismer about household toxicities. Now, one of the most common and dangerous household products poisonous to our pets is antifreeze. But we need to be extra cautious around several other items too. More on that coming up, so stay with us. Production of the Paul Report is brought to you by Dave's Decorating Center is a proud supporter of the Paul Report on WEIU. Dave's Decorating Center features the Mohawk Smart Strand Silk Forever Clean Carpet. Dave's Decorating Center, Authorized Mohawk Color Center in Charleston. Okaw Vet Clinic in Tuscola and Dr. Sally Foote remind you to properly take care of your pets and are happy to help support the Paw Report on WEIU. Okaw Vet Clinic located at 140 West Sale Street in downtown Tuscola. More information available at okawvetclinic.com. We have a fantastic and very interesting and informative Paul report for you today. We're joined by Dr. Tina Wismer, and she is with the ASPCA APCC, which is the Animal Poison Control Center. And we're going to talk today all about, well, essentially pet proofing your home. I, I am floored and amazed at how many things in your home can be harmful to your pet and, and actually lethal too. And we're, and we're gonna talk about that. So thank yeah, you for joining welcome. us. Thank you for inviting me. You're new to the Paul Report. This is your first visit. So why don't you tell the viewers a little bit about you, how you got to Central Illinois and uh, where you've practiced and what you're doing now. Great. So I'm a Midwest kind of girl. Um, <laughs> I grew up in Michigan um, and ended up going to a small uh, private college in Ohio for undergrad and ended up at Purdue University um, where I got my veterinary degree. Went back home, worked in a daytime practice uh, for a while, and then in an emergency practice in Indiana. Found the job at Animal Poison Control, posted online, and thought, you know, I love toxicology. This is great. And I've been here for almost 18 years now. So uh, always a love for animals, always, always kind of knew you wanted to be a vet? Yes, and you know, I had one of those high school counselors that at the time said, you know, women really can't be veterinarians. So if you tell me I can't do something, you're on it. I'm right on it, exactly. <laughs> well, as I mentioned, today we're talking about, um, you know, household poisons, if you will, household toxicities. So lots of items, and you brought some, and we're going to talk about each of them and, and what they can do. Um, what are some of those items? You know, maybe the obvious, like antifreeze, um, and the not so obvious. Right. When we think about, you know, poison proofing your home, we always think about those cleaning products that are under the counter, or as you said, the antifreeze that's in the garage. Mm -hmm. But there's other things, especially some food items in that, that you and I can eat without a problem, but can be very bad for our pets. Let's talk about um, food items. We'll, we'll, we'll start the route there and kind of go through some of the ones that you brought, maybe some that, that you didn't, and talk about the harmful effects that they have. I was reading an article. I, we'll start with this because the article was titled Onion Breath, and I thought, Onion Breath? And so when I, when I started reading and doing some more research, a woman was trying to cure her dog's bad breath. Mm -hmm. Obviously, most pets have bad breath. And she was reading where onions could counteract that and actually be beneficial. Not so much. Not so much for our pets. Uh, when we think about onions and garlic, um, they contain compounds that can actually cause destruction of red blood cells in the body. So, you know, the dog that gets the one piece of onion off the hamburger, that's not gonna be a problem. But if they get that large container of French onion soup, that certainly can cause them to have um, anemia, so low red blood cells, in about three to five days after they get into it. And garlic is the same? Garlic is the same, yes. And they may require a blood transfusion. Now, is it all onions? I know there are different types of onions. So onions across the board, no, no. Everything in the onion family, from the red onions to the sweet vidalias, all the way to like chives, shallots, all of them contain the same type of compounds. Another no-no that you've brought, mm -hmm. raisins. Raisins, yeah. So grapes and raisins are real interesting. In dogs, they can actually cause kidney failure. 
Now we don't know what the toxic component is, um, but we do know that it can be a problem for some dogs. So we recommend never feeding your dogs grapes or raisins. Now is it, and, I, and you're gonna get into proportions when we talk about chocolate, and that's mm -hmm. probably what we're gonna get to next, but if a dog eats a box of a, a little raisin box, mm -hmm. I mean, is that harmful? So potentially, um, especially depending upon the size of your dog, but we've had, you know, dogs eat that small snack box of raisins and develop kidney failure. And also sometimes the problem is we don't know how many grapes or raisins the dog got into. You know, we'll have people that say, oh, my dog ate five grapes. And so we decide to induce vomiting so we can get those grapes back out of the system. And they vomit up, you know, 10 grapes. Mm -hmm. So we know they're not reproducing in the stomach. So sometimes it's hard to really estimate how much your animal actually got into. So mm -hmm. it's good to be on the safe side. Let's talk about chocolate. And you brought, you divvied out some different proportions. And I, I think did. that's very key because I was, I was amazed at one of the bags and how uh, minimal a dog has to ingest before it's, it can be a, a bad thing. Yes, we always talk about the dose determines the poison. Right. And especially when we talk about chocolate, it's all about the amount ingested, how dark the chocolate is, and how much your animal weighs. So for a 10 pound dog, if we're talking about milk chocolate, this is enough milk chocolate to make a 10 pound dog seizure. So it's about seven and a half ounces, okay? So it's a decent amount of chocolate, but you know, most 10 pound dogs are gonna try to eat that much if mm. they can. If it's in front of them. If it's in front of them, the bag of, you know, the batch of brownies, the bag of chips, they don't stop till it gets to the end. Now, if it is dark chocolate, then we're talking about three and a half ounces to cause seizures. So much smaller amount, but still enough to be a problem. It's about a third uh, as toxic, or sorry, three times more toxic than milk chocolate. But the really bad one is the baker's chocolate. And this is all it That's would it? take, three quarters of an ounce of baker's chocolate to cause seizures in a 10 pound dog. What's in, the, what's in it that so these makes it? contain something called methylxanthines, and methylxanthines are stimulants. And so they cause high heart rate, high blood pressure, tremors, and seizures. Chocolate can be lethal then. It can be, and we've seen a real change in the um, chocolate toxicities that we've seen. When we were growing up, you know, you'd buy that bag of miniatures and mom always got stuck with the special darks because none of us wanted to eat the dark chocolate. <laughs> That's true, everybody but, wants the milk. Exactly, <laughs> but the American palate has really changed and a lot of us really like that 70%, 85% cocoa dark chocolate now. So once again, it takes much less of an amount to cause a problem. Mm -hmm. You also have some chewing gum on I the table. I do have chewing gum. So what's the story behind chewing gum? So it's not just gum, but the, um, uh, excuse me, item contained in here is called xylitol. And xylitol begins with an X. It's X-Y-L-I-T-O-L, -L. so xylitol. It's an artificial sweetener. And we find it in a lot of sugar-free gums. Uh, we can also find it in a couple different brands of peanut butter. We can find it in toothpaste, mouthwash. It's great if you're a person because it decreases cavities. It also, um, is good for diabetics because it doesn't stimulate you know, their blood sugar to go up. But mm -hmm. in dogs, what the xylitol actually does is it increases insulin secretion. So it actually causes their blood sugar to drop. And we can actually see seizures and even liver failure. Mm -hmm. So you, know, you need to be careful with your purse when you set it down that the dog doesn't get into your sugar-free gum. That's the first place they'll go. Oh, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Grandma's purse is always a bad thing if the dogs get into it. What about, you know, you're sitting at the dinner table and of course the dogs are right there looking up at you. Can you give them table scraps? So, of course, we prefer to not have our animals beg, but yeah, I'm a softie. My husband is worse. <laughs> um, and we can give animals, you know, some things, but healthy things. So carrots, uh, green beans, plain pasta. You know, all of those are actually good, um, you know, kind of healthy items. Um, plain popcorn, great locale, healthy snack for our animals, all very safe. Let's move from food to plants because ah. there's a laundry list of plants that are oh. not good for our animals. And you would think, ah, oh, dog's not gonna eat that plant. My cat's not gonna get it. Yes, they do. They do. And there's a list of, of, of ones that you should, keep an eye on. Correct. Most of our common house plants are actually considered to be toxic for animals. 
Um, and so if it's got thick, shiny green leaves, so things like your philodendrons, your diefenbachias, all of those contain compounds um, that can cause problems. And these are insoluble calcium oxalate crystals, and they actually look like little needles. So when the animal bites into the plant, the plant actually kind of bites it back. It shoots those little needle-shaped crystals into the gums, the tongue, so it hurts. So you, we get swelling, we get drooling, you know, they stop eating the plant um, because it hurts. So it's mm -hmm. the plant's way of protecting itself. But some animals will chew long enough that they can actually get enough mouth swelling that it interferes with breathing. Now, when, is this just a leaf or would this be a whole plant? Mm -hmm. Again, it's always about how much that they eat, but exactly. sometimes pet owners don't know. Right. You um, know, they just, they start acting weird and they think that they've probably ingested something they shouldn't. Yeah, a bite or two of a leaf, probably not a big deal, okay? Mm -hmm. Certainly the dog that eats the entire plant um, can be a problem. Moving now to uh, people medicines. Yes. Your, um, you know, you open up your medicine cabinet, you notice your dog's not feeling great. Oh, I've got some baby aspirin here. Right. So is that, um, is that a do or a don't? Right. It's always a don't until you talk to your veterinarian. In some cases, it may be an appropriate medication to give, but we want the veterinarian's approval first. Your veterinarian is going to know, number one, what the appropriate dose is, and number two, does your animal have any problems um, that would say, hey, we don't want to give this medication? And, you know, number three, um, they may say, you know what, that's not going to treat this, and we need to bring that animal in and find out what's actually wrong. Mm -hmm. Now, what about, um, so we've talked about some food, we've talked about plants, we've talked about human medicine consumption. Mm -hmm. Let's just go back for a minute to the other items around your house, the, mm -hmm. the household products that you might have. I mean, I would say it, probably all of them are not good. I can't imagine, you know, if they got into anything that it would be, mm -hmm. it would be an okay thing. Right. So a lot of it has to do with the dilution and the amount that they get into. So if you take a little bit of, you know, detergent to clean your floor, you put it into water like the mop bucket, you mop the floor, you don't think about it, you turn around and, you know, Fluffy's drinking out of the mop bucket. Yes, it can cause some vomiting and some diarrhea, but the good news is it's been diluted. So we don't expect the real, you know, corrosive burns and the chemical burns that we can see if they get into the bottle directly. There's also some seasonal products. You know, yes. there's holidays where there's different things. There's also cold weather products. There's also hot weather products mm -hmm. that we all have around our our homes. So yes. talk about some of those that are sure. no-nos. So of course, as we previously mentioned, antifreeze is a horrible one uh, for animals to get into, and it takes very minimal amounts to cause death. Um, so we always want to make sure that, number one, our cars aren't leaking antifreeze, and number two, if we're changing the antifreeze, we don't leave the empty containers around. It takes very little um, to cause death in our pets. What about like ice melt? Right, so ice melts um, tend to be pretty corrosive, uh, most of them, to the paws. So you know, your animal walks on it, they come in, they lick it off, they can actually get burns on their paws and in their mouth. There are pet safe antifreezes out there, or excuse me, pet safe um, ice melts, mm -hmm. and that's what I would recommend using. Other household products that are up there with antifreeze? Right, probably um, a real common one that living in central Illinois, we may all have around are rodenticides, so mm -hmm. mouse bait, rat bait. Um, typically, most of us use like these little mm -hmm. green blocks. Mm -hmm. um, I live right across from a field. One year it's corn, one year it's soybean, and when they harvest, the mice all come in the house. Mm -hmm. Probably the best method of killing mice are cats, um, but <laughs> you know, if your cats are lazy or if they, um, you don't have cats, then we can use rodenticides. The problem is that if dogs or cats eat the rodenticide, they can be poisoned themselves. And when we talk about rodenticides, there are several different types out there. Some cause bleeding, some cause seizures, some cause kidney failure. So if you're using these products, always keep the label so that your veterinarian knows what type of rodenticide they could have gotten into and how to treat them appropriately. Um, most rodenticides today are going to come in little um, boxes, like a plastic box or a metal box. And the plastic boxes are supposed to be children safe, 
That doesn't mean they're dog safe. You know, a Jack Russell Terrier can chew through one of those plastic boxes in no time flat mm -hmm. and get to the rodenticide. So make sure not to put those anywhere where your pets are around. Um, if you don't have cats, live traps um, can work well. You can have the typical wooden snap traps or you know these plastic guys um, mm -hmm. around the house. Not the nicest thing to clean up afterwards. Um, they also make live traps um, where the mouse goes in and doesn't come out. So those are also options for you. We've talked a lot about the toxicities around mm -hmm. our home. And I, I think what a lot of people don't know is there is a place that they can turn. And, and that's something that you're a part of, and that's the Poison Control Center yes. uh, through the ASPCA. Give us a little history about the center, where it's at and how it was established, and, mm -hmm. and then we'll kind of launch into the things that the center does. Great. So the center started in the early 70s um, with Dr. Buck, and he was a veterinary toxicologist at the University of Illinois. And when the service originally started, it dealt mostly with large animal cases. You know, um, a herd of animals was affected. The students would actually go out to the pasture and they would look at poisonous plants. They would check the feed, they would check the water, what could be the source of what was going on. And over the years, um, our focus has changed from large animals to small animals, so companion animals. Uh, most of our calls at Poison Control now are about dogs. Dogs sample the world with their mouth and unfortunately eat a lot of things. Mm -hmm. um, we also get calls about cats, horses, you know, pocket pets um, that other people own. At this point, we receive about 164,000 calls a year. Wow. Yeah. Um, so animal cases, chocolate is real big, um, rodenticides, human medications. You know, many times the typical call is, I dropped my blood pressure medication, my dog ate it, is he gonna die? Mm -hmm. So what we do is we ask you important questions. How old is your animal? How much does it weigh? What medication did it eat? How long ago? So we can determine, is this not going to be a problem or do you need to seek veterinary um, assistance right away? And you get calls from all over the country. We do, all over the US and Canada. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, we're a 24-hour hotline, so depending upon what shift you work, you can kind of watch the country wake up in the morning. Um, you know, the East Coast calls start coming in about four or 5 a.m. our time, and then, you know, when everybody here is asleep, you know, at one or two a.m., most of our calls come from the West Coast. So it's all staffed by, by veterinarians then? It's veterinarians, veterinary technicians, and some uh, veterinary assistants. And it's 24 hours a day? 24 hours a day, yeah. So they will, um, if you, the phone is answered by the assistants or the technicians, they'll triage the call. If it's something that's not going to be a big problem that they have a protocol for, they'll handle the case themselves. Otherwise, it'll be bumped up to a veterinarian. Now, uh, there's other toxicology programs, though, that, that your center deals with. Talk about some of those and some of the educational missions that, that you participate in. Sure. So as part of the ASPCA, um, we help um, do a lot of things with um, the national um, ASPCA, which is located in New York City. And uh, we help with uh, like the spay-neuter uh, programs. We also help um, give grants to people who can't afford veterinary care. Um, so there's a lot of different things that we do. We also help with deployments. If there's like a dog fighting ring um, we will, or a hoarding situation, we will send our veterinary staff to help. Now, no question is a dumb question. Not I, at I, all. I'm gonna share a little story with our viewers. <laughs> but years ago, I had these trays made for, you know, to straighten your teeth and mm -hmm. you would wear them. They were like rubbery mm -hmm. and you would wear them every night. Well, I would keep them on the bathroom counter and I had a yellow lab, uh, Winnie was her name, and Winnie got up on the counter, found the, the plastic teeth inserts and chewed them up and I was in panic mode and I didn't know where to turn. You know, I mean, I ended up calling my vet to mm -hmm. say, she chewed up about half of them, what should I do? And you know, the rest is history. But I think it's very important to know, uh, for people to know that there, there is another place that they can turn. Mm -hmm. But you also work very closely and you encourage them to work very closely with their vets. Is that kind of the mission of, of the call center? Yes, you know, if you have any type of question at all, call your veterinarian first. If they don't know whether that pill is toxic or what the toxic dose is, then they may refer um, you to us. But yeah, start with your veterinarian. They know your pet the best. Mm -hmm. They're gonna have their medical history. Uh, 
once you get all, you know, you take, you said how many, 100,000 calls mm -hmm. a year, if, if, if not more. Um, people out there may want to know, so do you do animal research? Um, you don't test on animals, but you do a lot of research. Correct, so we do what we call data mining. So we have every case, every person that calls, all the information is entered into the computer. So we have the weight of the animal, the amount of uh, whatever item they got into. So we can actually go back and see, okay, at this dose we expect X, Y, Z to happen, or this is not going to be a problem. So we're able to do research without actually having to have research animals. Um, and that's actually how we determine the whole grape and raisin thing being a problem. One of our veterinarians on the hotline took a phone call from another veterinarian whose dog had eaten like a pound of raisins and was in kidney failure. And we were like, no, I don't think it's related. That same veterinarian just happened to two days later get another call from another veterinarian whose dog got into a bunch of grapes and was also in kidney failure. Mm -hmm. So we were able to go back and look in our database and say, you know, we've got all these calls with dogs developing kidney failure after they got into grapes. You know, there must be something here. And then um, it's been able to be looked at in like cell culture to determine, yeah, there is some compound in grapes and raisins that can cause kidney failure in dogs. I'm going to put you on the spot. Is there any other sure. um, call, series of calls mm -hmm. that stands out in your on your research, uh, very similarly to the raisins and the grapes? Anything else that you've, over the years, come yes. across? Yes. Um, cats and true lilies. So your Easter lilies, those beautiful stargazer lilies, all of those are extremely toxic to cats and also cause kidney failure. So if you have cats, no true lilies in the house, please. What happens if I know something's wrong with my pet, but I don't know what they ingested? Sure. So we want to give your veterinarian a call. Um, and, you know, if you don't know what's going on, you know, maybe your animal has vomiting or diarrhea, your veterinarian will be able to say, okay, you know, these are things that we know that cause vomiting or that cause liver problems or that cause kidney problems. And we can maybe say, okay, do you have any of these items in your house that your animal could have been exposed to? In the last couple of minutes, Dr. Wismer, let's mm -hmm. talk about a first aid kit. Sure. <laughs> We've talked about all the bad stuff. Uh, we need to keep some good stuff on hand in case, uh, you know, our, our golden retrievers and our labs and our cats get into all this stuff that you have on the table. So as we finish up here in the last couple of minutes, uh, let's go through a first aid kit. Sure. So certainly if an animal has something on its skin, okay, whether that's tar or paint, Liquid dishwashing detergent, whatever you hand wash your dishes with, is the best thing to use to go ahead and take that off. However, always remember, you should wear gloves too, mm -hmm. because if it can be absorbed through their skin, it could be absorbed through your skin. So for dealing with like paint thinner or those type of things, always wear gloves. Mm -hmm. If an animal has ingested something that could be poisonous, we may want to induce vomiting. This is definitely something you wanna check with your veterinarian first about because there are certain things like cleaning products we don't want to induce vomiting with because if it burns going down, it's going to burn coming back up. But if we're going to induce vomiting at home, what we usually recommend is hydrogen peroxide. You know, the 3% stuff you get in the brown bottle that you put on your cuts and scrapes, mm -hmm. it bubbles in the stomach. Your veterinarian can give you the appropriate dose to give and it causes vomiting usually in about 10 to 15 minutes. Two important items. Yes. Another thing, certainly if animals get anything in their eyes, you can use tap water or saline solution that you use to you know, uh, rinse your contacts with. All of that can help get stuff out of the eyes. Gauze and other, other things like that should also be included. And you know, we keep it for us, but mm -hmm. you know, we don't think about keeping a kit with materials that you just mentioned and also their charts, you know, their, you know, information about them because we've talked about that with past veterinarians and it's very important to keep that packet all together. Exactly. And those little rubber tubs that they make now, those are wonderful places. You can stick all that stuff in there. Just make sure the hydrogen peroxide, change it out occasionally so it's a fresh bottle because if it's flat, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you've got everything right there. Yeah, Dr. Wismer, some great information, useful information, very informative, and I'm, I'm sure we've probably helped some pet owners out there great. today. So thank you for coming on the Paul Report for the first time. Thanks. It was and fun. thank you for joining us, and be sure to watch all of the episodes of the Paul Report on our website at weiu.net. We'll see you next time.
If you're a veterinarian, trainer, groomer, specialist, rescue organization, or shelter that would like to partner with The Paw Report by providing expert guests for the show, please contact us by emailing weiu at weiu.net or call 217-581-5956. If you have a topic you'd like to see on the show or questions for our experts, contact us with those too. Did you know full episodes of The Paul Report are on YouTube? They can be accessed at youtube.com slash weiutv. Then just go to The Paul Report playlist and select the episode you want to see. More information about the show is also available 24-7 on our website at weiu.net under the television tab. Production of The Paul Report is brought to you by... Okaw Vet Clinic in Tuscola and Dr. Sally Foote remind you to properly take care of your pets and are happy to help support The Paw Report on WEIU. Okaw Vet Clinic located at 140 West Sale Street in downtown Tuscola. More information available at okawvetclinic.com. Dave's Decorating Center is a proud supporter of The Paw Report on WEIU. Dave's Decorating Center features the Mohawk Smart Strand Silk Forever Clean Carpet. Dave's Decorating Center, Authorized Mohawk Color Center in Charleston.